Alice. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I am Melissa. I'm an alcoholic. Yeah, Melissa. Oh, I have not spoken over two years now, so this is my first time speaking in a while. I've been on the bench for a while. Um, they tell us we're supposed to carry a message, not a mess, and I've been a mess, so I try not to carry that around, not to share it with everybody anyway. So I don't know what I'm doing here today. I haven't tried to plan it or rehearse it or figure out what I'm going to say because I already know there's no point in all that. I'm nothing, I can plan it, but it's not going to come out the way I plan anyway. So um, as Wallace mentioned, my sobriety date is July 3rd, 2013. Just picked up seven years recently, and... Some days it feels like it's been seven years, and some days it feels like it's just been a couple of days. I still feel like a newcomer, and I hope I always feel that way. I really do. Um, well, let's see, I've been born and raised Rockingham County my whole life. I'm great AA there. It's where my home group has been. I pretty much consider all of Reedsville, North Carolina, my home group. Um, it's some great recovery there, and... I'm not used to this whole Zoom thing. I'm looking at this computer screen in front of me. I'm not really used to that. I've, since the pandemic, you know, I've called in to a few Zoom meetings and put it on mute and went about my day and didn't really feel a part of. Um, so I'm not used to seeing that computer screen, but thank God that we've kept some meetings going because there's nothing to me like coming in and taking my seat. You know, it's like coming home. It's, it's home to me, coming into a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and don't quite get that feeling on a computer or on a phone with it, with it on mute, washing dishes. So I'm grateful for it, though. It is a great tool, considering what we've been going through. Um, so, all right, what it was like, what happened, and what it's like today. Um, again, I come from Reedsville, North Carolina, born and raised, and stayed in Rockingham County my whole life. Um, I was born into the insanity of this disease of alcoholism. I'm going to try to keep this light. I really want to because I feel like everything going on in the world right now is so heavy. And I argued with poli about politics all the way here with Rick, and I'm going to leave him here. Uh, he's not coming home. With no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm, I'm kidding. No, I, I, we really didn't. But it's just, you know, it's amazing to me that so many people from so many different backgrounds and so many different religions and so many different sexual orientations, and it doesn't matter where you're from, who you are, what you've done, we all come together and we have this common disease, alcoholism and addiction. And we can focus on that. We don't have to argue with each other, and he might get a ride home. And you know, it, 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 I don't think there's a program anywhere in the world quite like this, where you know we are with a group that normally would not mix. That is so true. But thank God, because coming in here, my my mind is opened. My I can see things from different points of view. I can take myself outside of myself and try to see things from other people's point of view. And I kind of wish the world, I wish everybody had a 12-step program right now. I really do. But thank God I have one today. And I'm so grateful for the people who shared this with me. I'd, I'd be dead without it. Um, as I said, I was born into the insanity of this disease. And I'm not really sure. Some days I think it's hereditary and some days I think it's conditioning. And I don't know. It doesn't matter. When I came in, I wanted to pick it apart, and I wanted to understand why was I blessed with this thing, this alcoholism, and why, 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 why. I, I was a why child, and I wanted to know why, so I'd done the research, and I tried to pick it apart, and, you know, with all that energy I put into it, what I came down to was it doesn't really matter why the fact is I'm an alcoholic, and if I drink, I'll die. If I drink, I'll die. So... You know, the whys are important to a lot of people, but today I try to keep it really simple, and it doesn't matter why. The fact is, I'm an alcoholic, and I want to live. I don't want to die. So I'm going to try this thing. I try to work this thing to the best of my ability every single day, and I fall short every single day. I've been through a lot in sobriety, and I don't know how I'm still sober. And I don't really feel like I can take credit for that. There are times where the group has carried me, where my people in AA have carried me, when God has carried me every day. So grateful for that, um, but I was born into it and can remember growing up with, you know, it was the norm. It was my reality. Every day was, there was alcohol around and there was people, you know, my, both sides of my family worked a tobacco company and there was, you know, just, there was cigarettes around, there was alcohol around, there was moonshine around, there were other substances, outside issues, things were always around and 
it was really normal to me. It was my normal. Um, I remember at five years old taking my first drink willingly. I grew up, alcohol was used as medicine. You know, if you got a cough, rock and rye, or a teething baby, you'd whiskey on the gums and we keep it moving. You know, it was used that way. And some people can do that, <laughs> not I. But um, at five years old, I stole a beer. I, my dad had a party and there were people in the yard and, hey little girl, run get me a beer. Hey little girl, run get me a beer. Well, I was running back and forth getting everybody beers and decided they were having a great time and I wanted to do that too. And so went and got my own beer <laughs> and my own cigarette and a book of matches. Plus if I'm gonna do it, let's just do it, I guess. I don't know. I don't know what I was doing. But we had a little well pump house outside and nobody ever went in there unless there was a problem with the well pump. It was a little small, it was just my size. And so I took my little beer and my cigarette and my book of matches out there and I commenced to drink that beer and smoke a cigarette. It took me forever to figure out how to strike that match, but once I did it, whew, that, that, yeah, it hit pretty hard. I don't know what I was doing with that thing. I coughed and gagged and tried to drink that beer, and it was, oh, it was rough, but I don't, that was just a horrible combination all at one time, but we grew up with that, um, you waste not, won't not. You don't waste anything, and I done opened it, so I drank it. I held my nose and I drank it and everything turned out fine. No, <laughs> there was no consequences and I don't really remember much at five years old. I don't remember a whole lot, but nothing bad happened. There was no consequences. Nobody missed a beer and nobody missed a cigarette or the matches and life went on. And every chance I got from that point on, you know, I would slip something here or there. There was always something under the kitchen sink or you just screw the top off the jar and, you know, Winter time, it was cold, so moonshine was like antifreeze. You just take a little chug, and you can feel that stuff warm up. You can start feeling your toes again, and you're good to go. Let's go. So I knew at a young age something wasn't quite right with me either, though, because if I couldn't find it or couldn't, I would drink Dimetap out of the medicine cabinet if it was there or codeine cough syrup or just anything. I didn't even really need to know what it was, but if it looked like it was going to do something to me to change the way I feel, I was going to try it. And the theme of my life, I think, it followed me. Um, by the time I was in middle school, my home life was not great, so I stayed gone as much as I could. I enjoyed school. Um, I was, you know, a really good student with a little bit of effort, and the teachers gave me attention, and I enjoyed school, so I excelled. I made very good grades, and I kept quiet, and I used my manners. That's what, thank God I was taught manners and how to say ma'am and sir, because I think it got me out of a, kept me out of a lot of trouble. I just kind of flew under the radar. Um, my mom, she was in and out of prisons and treatment centers and homelessness and different situations my whole life, and she wasn't really around, and when she came around, there was trouble to be had all the time. Um, so that was a great influence in my life. I can remember in middle school, I started extracurriculars, cheerleading, and I was in AG, academically gifted. I had them fooled, too. Um, <laughs> yeah. that being quiet, keeping quiet, flying under the radar got me into a lot of work sometimes. But um, I remember she showed up. My mom had been absent most of my life. And, again, anytime she sh she showed up, it was some something was getting ready to come up. Something was going to happen, and it's just like prepare yourself. Um, she showed up at one of our games and I was cheering and I, from my seat, watched her fall up the bleachers and fall back down the bleachers. So it was just, it was not good at all. And everybody's looking around, is that your mom? I just wanted to disappear. I just wanted to, yeah, that's her. <laughs> there she is. So that was kind of the way our relationship went through the years. She would show up and I would try to fix her. One of my character defects here is I can people please and fix things and I would try to fix her and it never worked and I couldn't understand it and if she loved her children she would straighten up. Had it in my head. If she really loved us she would act like a mother. If she really loved us she wouldn't run off and drink and do drugs. I had no clue what this disease was all about. I had no idea that this woman was battling this disease that I ended up with, I get it, you know? And people who don't get it don't have this disease, I don't think. It's, 
It, it's mind-boggling. It absolutely will blow somebody's mind, the things we will do in the act of addiction and alcoholism. And I saw it for myself. I had a perfect example, yet here I am. This is a very powerful disease. And I do want to keep this light. I really, really do. But the truth is, this disease wants me dead. And it's really hard for me to make light of that. It's, it's really hard for me to make light of this situation that, I, that we have found ourselves in. Um, there were some entertaining times through the years, and, you know, we've all done th things and had a good time until we didn't. I don't really know when I crossed the line. If I was born alcoholic or if I crossed the line, if there was a line there to be crossed, I don't know. I, there are days I just think I was born this way. I don't know. Um, my mom came in and out of the program. She was in, incarcerated, and somebody brought the meeting into the place where she was at. She started this thing called AA, and I didn't really know anything about it, but um, I was probably seventh grade, I think she was released, and she came out, and she kept going to meetings on the outside, and she was doing really good. She was, you know, she got a job, and she was going to work every day, and her attitude was changing, and, and I still didn't trust. I had a real hard time trusting, but for a while, she'd done this thing. She took me to some meetings. And that plan of the seed, I am so grateful for that. I'm grateful for the meetings that came in to, to the prison she was at. I don't think I'd be here without those. Um, by the time I was in high, she went back out again, by the way. It, it, it didn't take. She didn't surrender. May not be able to be honest with herself. I'm not really sure that's her story. But she went back out, and it didn't end good. Um, but... By the time I was in high school, I know for a fact I was full-blown alcoholic. It was no doubt about it. She was back doing her thing. And my home life, I was I bounced around as a child, living kind of here, there, different relatives and places, just staying anywhere other than, than my dad's house. And by the time I was 16 years old, I had gone there for the last time. I was just done. So at 16, I was on my own and working third shift and still going to school during the day and somehow I managed to graduate high school but by the time I was 17 years old I was sick I was so sick this disease had eat me up um I didn't want to admit that it was the alcohol because it can't be the alcohol <laughs> no um, I went to a counselor at school and I explained that I'm sick and I think it's the drugs, the outside issues that I'm doing, and they helped me find a place um, in Alamance County to go. I didn't know. I just wanted help, and I was willing to do anything at that point. I'm not sure. I was just tired and tired of living the way I was living. I just wanted a bed and a good meal, and to, you know, I'm not really sure what I wanted, but I was reaching out for help, and I got some help, but I was 17 years old, so... I was not legally an adult, not able to make legal decisions for myself. And when I got to Alamance County, they wouldn't admit me because I was under the legal age. And I told them I wasn't leaving. I was hard-headed then, too. Mm -hmm. So I sat down, and they called the cops on me. Uh, well, they really are going to get rid of me. That, they didn't call the cops to get rid of me. That's just what I thought. They took me in front of downtown in front of a judge, and... The judge gave me permission to sign myself in as an adult. So they took me back to the hospital. They still put me in the dang pediatric ward, though. The first thing I saw walking through the doors was a giraffe on the wall. And there were little kids, little, little kids. And I was like, well, hmm, what is going on here? So I guess I was in the behavioral unit or so. I don't know. To this. Oh, it was not treatment, but it was a bed. And it was a safe place. And there was food there. And, you know, I stayed my little time. And I got back on my feet as far as my weight and putting some, you know, food, meat on my bones and getting a little healthier. And when it came time to go, I didn't want to leave because I knew I was not okay. We didn't go to meetings. And there was no 12-step program. They got my work from the high school, so I was able to keep up with my studies and I wasn't falling behind. But we weren't talking about being powerless over alcohol or our lives becoming unmanageable. That, that wasn't discussed. Um, there were things that happened in there that had absolutely nothing to do with recovery and 
I guess it's just because I was on the pediatric ward. They couldn't cater to me, my <laughs> alcoholic self. I don't know. They were just trying to keep the kids with Ritalin and keep them, keep them calm down or something. I don't know what was going on, but it wasn't long. I left. Um, I left the hospital, but, you know, I remember what my, some of the things my mom had said, and I remember this thing called AA. So I ended up at a meeting in Reedsville, and I was 17. I looked like I was 12. I was 17 years old, and I went down to the Presbyterian Church in Reedsville and went down the basement steps, and whew, I was in the wrong place. They looked at me like I must be crazy. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Those older men just... They didn't, it was just awkward situation. I think they didn't know whether to say the daycare's on the other side of the building or, I don't, we were just all confused, but I sat down and I stuck around for a little while, but it didn't last long. I ended up right back out there running just as hard as before, less a few outside issues because they really did take me down quick, but alcohol was not my problem. <laughs> alcohol was not my problem. Um, alcohol has been my drug of choice for forever. Uh, it, was, it just couldn't have been my problem. So I ended up, you know, bumping right along. And I finished high school, and not long after that, I found myself pregnant. And I had already been drinking and carrying on for two weeks during that, the beginning of that pregnancy. So here I was at 18 years old, pregnant, and I'm an alcoholic. I was able to stop at that point. I wasn't too far gone. I didn't need medical treatment. I, I think, you know, I was sick and I was shaking. I had dreams about alcohol. There were times during that pregnancy I would dream that I had drank and I could taste it and I'd get up and wander around and just make sure there was no alcohol there because it was so real. I could taste Jim Beam and I know what I'm tasting and whew, yes. But I did not drink throughout that pregnancy. I was very honest with the doctors at the beginning of that pregnancy as to what I had done, and I was able to quit, but I knew I would drink again. I knew it was just a matter of time, and my situation was not great. The one thing I did not like about my childhood, one thing that really bothered me um, when I was at home with my dad was the constant flow of traffic in and out, in and out, in and out. There was always somebody coming or going, and you never knew what they wanted or what time they were leaving or how long they'd been there or what they wanted. I did not like that as a child. I had, you know, I didn't like that. Well, then I found myself pregnant, and the fellow that I decided would be a great dad ugh, was a drug dealer. So there was a lot of traffic coming and going and in and out and all hours of the night. And I'm like, wow, the one... The situation I could not stand as a child, I found myself in. You know, that's looking around like, I made this choice. What is wrong with me? I knew something was wrong with me. But I knew I had to get out. I'd done the best I could in that situation and buy, you know, buy my time and squirrel back some money here and there, do the best I could do to try to get out. And I did eventually get out, but it was a really bad situation to get out of and took a lot of years. <laughs> um, but my daughter, she was born healthy. May May 12th, uh, I'm sorry, February 12th, 1999. I forgot my own child's birthday. Lord have mercy. I'm going to blame that one on her brain cells. <laughs> February 12th, 1999. She was born healthy, almost eight pounds. And thank God, because during the pregnancy, I had dreamed, you know, that she was, that my drinking, my lifestyle before had caused problems. And, and she was born healthy. I don't know why God decided I, I deserved a healthy child. I really don't know because I was not in a position to be a good parent or to be even a half-assed parent, excuse me, but it is what it is. I was just in no position to have a child, and I had never had a mother, so I had no clue how to be a mother. And it's just like my situation got really real really quick. It's like reality set in, and here I am, and I just want to drink. I just want to drink. I don't want to really deal with it, but I ended up getting out on my own, and I was a single parent, and have been a single parent her whole life, and we struggled there early in her childhood, but I was able to maintain my drinking. I was able to, you know, exercise some self-control for a while, and oh, it was so gradual. It seemed gradual. Now I can look back and, and see how it was, and it was just doing push-ups, you know, and I'd start out 
you know, cook, take her to school, go to work, come home, cook dinner, bed, bath time, book time, bed time, and then I would drink, and it would just progress. Well, I could have one drink before her bath time. Well, I can have one drink while I'm cooking dinner. Well, I can have one drink before I cook dinner. Well, I'm, I just walked in the door, let me get a drink. Well, by the time she was six years old, that's when I took my morning drink. Ugh. Ugh. I had missed the morning night before. I have no idea what time I went to bed. And I was a whiskey and water. And I didn't mix it, just a shot and wash it down if I need it. I have no idea how much I drank the night before. But I came to, she was six years old in first grade. And I knew I was just going to be sick all day. We, we're not doing this day to day. And there, I'm not even going to wake her up to get her dressed to take her to school. Because I feel so bad I can't function. And I was like, you know, might have a problem. And I thought, well, if I'm not going to do anything, I'm not going to work and she's not going to school, I might as well just drink. So I took that morning drink and the shakes went away and the, the pounding in my head just kind of eased up just a little bit. And it's like, wait a minute, I'm feeling a little bit better about life right now. Let me take another drink. <laughs> so I took another drink and it's like... 5.30 in the morning, I'm standing in the kitchen, and I'm drinking, and it's like, ah, oh, okay, I can do this. So I started my coffee, and I got in the shower, and dang, y'all, I functioned. This is the answer. This is the key to life. I have arrived. That was my I have arrived moment. Yeah, that's so sick. That is sick thinking. But I remember, I remember just how, how much sense life made at that moment. Like, I had the key. Like, everything made perfect sense. And then I got my daughter up and got her ready for school. And when I pulled in that school parking lot that morning, I remember looking at other parents in the cars with their kids, and they're drinking their coffee. And the teacher that's standing at the front of the school waiting to get them out, she's got her cup of coffee, too. And then the principal's out there directing traffic with a cup of coffee in one hand. Oh, I'm brilliant. I finally realized everybody is doing this medicated. Everybody's drinking. They've got alcohol in their coffee cups. And they did not share the secret to life with me. It's like everything made perfect sense that day. I, I you know, I had, to t I had it figured out. So this is how I'm going to live the rest of my life. And I commenced to live the rest of my life this way. Every morning started the same way. Every single morning. I'd be sick, just so sick. I'd get up it with enough time to be sick. So my daughter didn't know how sick I was. And, and I'd fight that first shot down. And it didn't always stay down. It took a few sometimes. But once I could keep that first shot down, then my day could really get started. And I could, I could handle life, you know. Just let me get that first shot down and I can get through the day. Some days it went down smooth and other days I about died. But it was going to stay down or I was not going to get anything done. I would pull a half a gallon. I'm frugal too, y'all, by the way. I, I'm, I'm frugal because I had to be. I'd pull out my half gallon from under the sink with my funnel. And my little bottles that I saved, I saved half pint bottles and little airplane bottles. I love the half pint bottles because they were so convenient. And I would put that funnel in, and I'd fill up my bottles for the day, and I'd measure out what I would need. And I had it down to a science, and I knew how much I needed. You know, when the bottle got low enough, I better, you know, I had a spare under the spare tire in the car. That's what spares are for. That's where you put your spare bottle. Yeah. Oh, it was so sick. And, and I commenced to pour in coffee in my whiskey in my coffee cup like the other parents at the school, you know, because that's yeah. what they're, <laughs> there was just enough coffee to smell like coffee, I thought, you can't smell the whiskey, the, the bottom shelf whiskey too, by the way, oh, uh, I started my day drinking my coffee, dropping my kid off, have a great day, and I'm going to work, and I've got a half pint slid between my seat and the console, and when my cup got low, I could be sitting beside a cop at a stoplight. I could twist the top off of that bottle looking straight ahead yeah. and pour it in my cup and put it back and just wave at the cop. Hi, have a great day. You know, it blows my mind. How, oh, it blows my mind. It really does. My first break at work, I'd go sit on the back on the toilet and drink an airplane bottle and just sit there and ponder life like, 
lunch is so far away. And then lunch would come, and I would go to the car and drink my lunch because there was another half pint bottle sitting out there. And I don't care how hot it is. It's in the middle of summer. I don't care how hot it is. I don't know. It's a black car with black interior, and there's a half pint bottle just waiting for me. Don't that sound good? No, Yummy. No, no, no. I drank my lunch, yes. Mm -hmm. And then my last break would be back on the toilet with an airplane bottle. And then we would take the drive home with the twist the top off and put it in the coffee cup and slide it back down, and nobody knew, and I was functioning. I was doing life. Ugh, I was so sick. I was just, just so sick. My sponsor picks on me because he said I was telling him all about my problems and, you know, spilling it. And I was like, I, he's, I said something about, you ever had another sponsee master the art of the silent heave? He said, what? It's like, well, I had my daughter at home. And I didn't want her to hear how sick I was so I can throw up quietly. He was like, oh, yes, you're sick. <laughs> yes, I am. I'm very sick. You know, that's just the physical sickness. That says nothing about the mental twist that this disease causes. You know, I was there for my daughter physically. I never had a mom around. So I was dang determined I was going to do better and I was going to be there for my child. And I didn't have much of a relationship with my dad either. Well, uh, I was physically there for my daughter. I was physically there going through the motions and I was putting her in school and I was going to work and I was handling it, supposedly handling it. But emotionally, I was so disconnected. I was not available. I did not take time, you know, to enjoy anything with her because I was in a hurry and it was inconvenient and I wanted to drink. I didn't enjoy the simple things like going to the park because, you know, that's not convenient when I might need to drink, you know. Why can't you just play in the yard? I, I'm, I missed out on a lot. I'm glad I was there physically, don't get me wrong. I think that's God doing for me what I couldn't do for myself. He knew, you know, that that child needed a parent. Her dad hasn't been around either, so he knew the child needed a parent, but whew, it takes what it takes. <clears throat> and I'm glad I came in and got sober. Uh, but I wish I could, you know, I wish she would have got to experience a sober mom in her in her younger years. Um, but again, it takes what it takes, and she's grateful I'm here now. Um, she's 21 now, and this program's had a huge impact on her life. Um, she was 13, 14 when I came in the program, and she's seen a big change in my life, and I've seen a huge change in hers. You know, I took her to church and things as a child, but we didn't really have a whole lot of talks about God and prayer and spirituality. I taught her the rehearsed prayers that I know, and, you know, that's the, I didn't have a relationship with any higher power, so how was I going to teach her how to have one? That's what you folks did for me. I came into AA, and I don't, you know, I heard that God, y'all kept talking about God, and I didn't like that, I didn't like that at all, and I didn't want to talk about that. I didn't think that should be a requirement, and I didn't think I should have to do the fourth and fifth step either, and I didn't think that. I, I shouldn't have to do all these things because I'm only here because I don't want to drink. You know, I came in because I don't want to drink, and y'all keep talking to me about God. Ugh. 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 But thank God you did because I have a relationship with my higher power today, and my daughter has a relationship with her higher power today, and that's because of this program. Um, it's popping in my head right now. Um, I have a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of my spiritual condition. It doesn't say religious condition, and I'm grateful for that. It took me a while with the word God, but I could wrap my mind around spirituality a lot, a lot quicker than I could religion, and I'm still that way today. Thank God it says, step three, God as we understood him. I didn't hear that part. Every time y'all said God, I, I didn't hear the rest of that sentence, but finally the light bulb came on, and I heard that too, but... I came in and out through the years. I'm not a one-chip wonder. July 3rd, 2013 is not my first sobriety date. Um, but I wasn't willing to embrace God. I wasn't willing to embrace everything that I was required of me if I wanted this way of life. I wanted to pick and choose. and I wanted people to, you know, off my back. I came in one time for work. They picked up on an issue, and I just wanted to save my job, so I'll do whatever. And I came in, and of course... As soon as I was out of hot water, I was right back out there making a mess of myself. And, but 
but <coughs> excuse excuse me um july 3rd 2013 i'm not sure what happened and i can't call it a spiritual awakening and i didn't have a burning bush moment and i just came to and i did not want to live anymore i did not want to live and i did not want to die and i did not want to know what to do i had no idea what to do I had all the books from AA because I had come in and out of the rooms. And Reedsville, Rockingham County is a small area, and I've kept up with people through the years there. It's hard not to. We go to the Walmart and we see everybody we know. So it's pretty easy to keep up with folks. But when I came back in this time, it was like, you know, I guess I do know what to do. I came to AA. I didn't go into a hospital, and I didn't go to detox, and I didn't go to any kind of treatment. I snuck back in. I told my kid, you know, I'll be back in a little while. And I didn't tell her I was coming. You know, she's heard me so many times before say, I ain't going to drink. I ain't going to drink no more. And before you know it, I'd be in there drinking. So I didn't say anything to her. I snuck back into AA real quiet, like, and I kept sneaking out every night. And she finally realized, like, you're leaving and you're coming home and you're not drunk. And, and I was never a bar person either. When I drank, I drank at home. And... She started looking around and noticing there's no alcohol in the house. And I think I was probably about 30 days sober before it really occurred to her, you're going to AA. It's like she accused me. She came in there and she was with her attitude, you're going to AA. And I'm like, well, I, I feel like I'm in trouble or something. <laughs> like, I, well, yes, I am, but it might not work. And I was honest. You know, I was honest. It's like, yes, I'm going to meetings and it might not work. I don't know, but... I just don't want to drink for the day, just for the day. And that's it finally clicked. It's like the things that you guys teach us are so simple. The things you taught me are so simple, but I'm going to overcomplicate it. That 24 hours a day, that one day at a time, I don't know how to do that because I'm going to make plans for the rest of my life, and you'll see I'm never going to drink again <laughs> as I pull into the liquor store. <laughs> oh, oh, so. I came in July 3rd, 2013, and I picked up a start over chip. It must have been a good one because I'm still carrying it. It's over there in my purse right now. And I haven't felt the need to take a drink since, but life hasn't been easy. I didn't come in here and, and get that pink, right, pink, pink cloud that people talk about. I do think I was issued a pair of rose-colored glasses for a couple of years, but I didn't get the pink cloud, and <laughs> that's not fair. <laughs> not fair. <laughs> Life's not fair, neither is this disease. So I don't, I shouldn't expect any type of fairness anymore after this. But you know, I gradually started working the steps and taking suggestions and making a list of things that I didn't want to make a list of. You know, step four, my inventory. When I finally got real honest, the first person I can't call person, the first being that I have a resentment against. The first one on my list was God. That, that, word, that, that word that y'all kept saying, I didn't want to hear, and I didn't want any part of that. Or, yeah, I had to, get, had to dig in there and figure that one out. God, I was very, very resentful at God because if there was a God, he just didn't care for me or my sister or my brother because any type of God that has power to control what's happening in this world, why would he allow the things that happen to us to happen to us? Um, why would he, why? You know, that why? There I go again, that why child stuff. Why would he allow these things to happen? And it just didn't make any sense to me. If there was a God and he's so good, why would he allow these things to happen? Well, I heard a lady in a meeting, and that's why I thank God, you know, I go to used to go to as many meetings as I could before all this mess. I heard a lady in a meeting, she said something about, she thought that way too, that some things had happened in her childhood. And why? If God's real, why don't he love me? Why didn't he take care of me? And somebody responded to her that, you know, things may have happened, but God kept her through it. She wouldn't be here today if God had not kept her through those things. And it's something, the light bulb, you know? There's a lot of children out there that don't survive childhoods like mine. There's a lot of children that don't survive childhoods like my brother went through and my sister went through. So God kept us. And it's like my perspective started changing. Y'all just kept talking and working on me and my perspective. It's We don't see things the way they are. We see things the way we are. And it's like, whoa, you know, I, 
Somebody could have said that to me a million times, but somebody said it one time and it finally made sense. That's, I don't understand this, this program and, you know, I want to pick it apart and di- dissect it and I want to understand it overnight and I want to know what you know and you know and you know and I can work myself to death trying to figure this thing out. When I sit back and relax, it's like it comes to me. It comes to me. It meets me where I'm at and I don't really have to struggle as hard as I do. I'm hard-headed, and I keep doing it, but I don't need, you know, I realize today when I, you know, stop, be still, let God do his job, just be still and be patient and wait. And another issue that it irritated me so bad, I heard people say early in recovery that they came in and prayed to God to remove the obsession to drink, and poof, it was lifted. And in my head, it's like pulling a rabbit out of a hat or waving a magic wand and Y'all should share that because I'm sitting in a meeting with untreated alcoholism and I'm coming out of my skin and you're talking about you prayed one time and your obsession has been lifted. Oh, that just, whoa, oh, it still bothers me because that's not my story. Oh, I came into meetings and I was, my first year was, oh my goodness, it was like I would sit on my hands and I could hear that clock ticking behind my head and It was all I could do to just sit there some nights because I knew by the time that clock, by the time we left, the liquor store would be closed. It was like, whoo, that was the hardest hour of the day. And one of the old timers told me that's why they started having meetings from 8 to 9 o'clock years ago because that's the hour before the the haunting hour or something before the liquor store closes. I get that. My first year, I get that because I knew, you know, I've got 10 minutes I could pull into that parking lot sideways right now and she would let me in the door. But I didn't thank God. I just sat around and I waited for this obsession to be lifted. And I'd done the work as suggested. And I felt like nothing was working. Nothing was working. Nothing was working. And then one day I'm sitting down at a meeting. I'm like, wonder how long it's been since I have obsessed over a drink. How long has it been since I've actually really thought about that feeling? I don't know when it was removed. I have no idea when the obsession was lifted. I thought I was going to know the date, the time, the location, who was standing near me. I thought that it was some magical moment because other people had described it to me that way. They had described a burning bush, and they had described a simple prayer, and their problems were solved. (laughs) That wasn't for me. But I don't know when my obsession was gradual. I am of the educational variety, too. Everything is gradual for me. Some people get it so simple, so easy, so I'm glad, I'm gr- good for them. I'm great, I'm glad for them. I am. But as a newcomer, I heard that and it's, I set my expectations that life's just going to get real good real quick. And it just doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. You know, people come in and they talk about getting this back and that back and all these things, the material things. And those were my thoughts in the beginning too. And Proof that this program has worked in my life is material things don't matter. I'll give up anything in this world if it's going to keep me sober. I, you can keep it. You can have it. I don't need it. I wouldn't trade the, the, the peace that I have in my heart today for anything or anybody or for any reason. Not at all. And I've struggled a lot. Things have happened to me in sobriety and to my family. My mom, that you know, alcoholic addict, she... Ended up drinking herself to death, but didn't die. She was wet brain, alcoholic dementia, and that lasted for years. Um, She finally passed away. It sounds bad the way I say it. I don't mean it the way it sounds, but if you'd have seen the quality of life, you'd understand. She, there was, it was bad. Um, She passed because of alcoholism, February 2017. And watching her die, you know, it's. It's just like her body quit working. She drank and drank to a point of never sobering up. So even with no alcohol, she had the mind of somebody who was saturated. And her body just stopped working from her feet to her legs, just worked its way up. Everything stopped working. Her, she lost her vision. She lost her hearing. She had no idea who was around her or what was going on. But what she does remember, what she did remember was alcohol. She did not know that I was her daughter or know my name, but if I came close to her with a cup of tea, you got whiskey. Like, you can't remember what year it is or where you're at. You don't even know your name, but you think you need worrying about whiskey. So that's the power of this disease. It completely destroyed that woman. 
it, you know, and it's a, it was hell to watch. It really was. She's at peace now. I know she is, and some don't make it. It's just, I don't, I don't want to see anybody else die like that when, when here we are. We have, we have a daily reprieve right here. We just follow, you know, a few simple steps, 12 simple steps, and try our best to follow the traditions too, not not do any harm or kill each other in the process of staying sober. I mean, we got a wonderful thing going here. We really do, and it's available to anybody at any time, no cost. And some people, I, I wish she would have made it, but again, some don't. I'm very grateful to her for planting the seed and bringing me into meetings and showing me there was a better way. And that, that survivor's guilt, I don't know why God chose for me to get it and for others to not get it. I don't know why I'm standing here today, and I don't do this thing quite right. I made a lot of mistakes in recovery, and, you know, a lot of those mistakes probably should have got me drunk, but God has not allowed that yet. He keeps putting me in places like this with people like y'all, and I don't always feel deserving or worthy, or, and I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know. Maybe one day I will, but I've been granted a hell of a gift, and I don't want to give it up, you know. The world's gone crazy, and we can still come in here and, and leave it at the door and talk about our common problem, you know, our disease of alcoholism and addiction, and we can get honest with, with each other about who we hurt and the things we've done, and we can laugh about some of that stuff too, you know. that Some of the stuff, but it's really not funny, and normal people would think we were crazy for laughing at our mistakes the way we do. But I'm going to tell you what, I, getting all that crap out, working the steps and, and getting those things out, it just it loses its power. And I'm so grateful to have this program and these steps and people like you that try to keep me on the path. I know it's hard, but I really do appreciate y'all putting up with me. And I'm going to keep coming back, God willing. So... I'm going to hush now. I think that's about all I got for tonight, y'all. So thank you.